Good morning, colleagues, and welcome to the 21st meeting of the in 2017 of Finance and Constitution Committee. As usual, make sure your mobile phones are in a mode that we cannot hear them and they don't interfere. Uh, the first item on the agenda is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's legislative <coughs> consent memorandum in respect of the EU withdrawal bill, which is currently being considered by the UK Parliament. For that purpose, we are joined for this item by Michael Russell, who is the Minister for UK Negotiations in Scotland's Place in Europe. Mr Russell is accompanied today by Scottish Government officials Ian Davidson and Gerald Byrne. The Minister has written to the Committee with a set of draft amendments that would rectify what he sees as deficiencies in the Bill, and Members have got hard copies of that, these amendments, and also a, co a copy of the letter which he sent to us. I welcome our guests to the meeting uh, and I invite Mr Russell, the Minister, to make an opening statement. Uh, Convener, given the detail which we've sent you already in terms of the amendments and other issues which we've raised with you and copied you into, I think it probably would be just as appropriate to start with questioning. I think people have heard a great deal from me in the last few weeks, so I'm, happy, I'm open to question. OK. That took me a bit by surprise. <laughs> um, I, I want to get into the amendments, obviously, and some of the issues around that uh, in due course, and I know that other members want to do the same. Um, but with you, attached to your letter was the, the list of 111 areas which will, um, the, the UK government's list of 111 areas uh, in, in, in an annex to, to the letter, which powers returning through the EU that intersect with the devolution settlement in Scotland. And, when, and I know that there's been some media coverage on that, but when I looked at the list and for the first time last night in, in detail, there were some surprises even for me. If I give you an example, um, and you and I share constituency boundaries, um, forestry domestic policy, um, or, or a second example, which, which I know that WWF have commented upon, onshore hydrocarbons licensing, which, um, or fracking in, in, in normal person's language, um, is, it was something that the Smith Commission uh, in terms of its deliberations was clear about that should be within the policy framework of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. Can you explain to us you know, what discussions that the UK Government have had with you about this list of 111, and in particular the two I've mentioned, so we can get an understanding of what they actually mean by these, are the uh, uh, particular elements, and, uh, and by talking about these two it might allow us to understand what it means for the rest of them. Of course, uh, we've had no formal discussions about <coughs> the details of the list because the list appeared out of the blue. Uh, a similar list was sent to Wales and a, a list sent to Northern Ireland, we understand, although I can't vouch for the Northern Ireland list because they don't presently have an administration. I do know about the, the Welsh list. Uh, this came, I think, from the Cabinet Office, um, and it, it, it essentially is the list of areas in which EU competence intersects with competencies of this Parliament. Now, um, it took us somewhat by surprise, I have to say, um, and there is a d ongoing discussion, as you are aware, between the First Secretary and the Secretary of State for Scotland and myself and the Deputy First Minister about the issue of frameworks. Now, this let letter relates to those frameworks because it appears to be the list of the areas in which frameworks uh, may be established. Um, now, if you look at forestry, you've raised forestry, I'm a former environment minister with responsibility for forestry. Forestry has been devolved since the beginning of this parliament. Uh, the Forestry Commission has operated uh, essentially as a devolved body in Scotland. Um, and there may be European regulation in forestry, but it's limited. Um, and why forestry then should become an area where there's a potential for essentially re-reservation, we do not understand. Uh, onshore hydrocarbons licensing or fracking is even more puzzling. Uh, as you are aware and as you've indicated, it was part of the discussion at the Smith Commission. It is in the Scotland um, Act 2015. There is a UK directive which sits above onshore oil and gas licensing. Um, the UK regime for that has to lie in line with the EU framework directive we will require to establish a licensing regime in line with the EU framework directive, and that is ongoing work, because we expect to do so. Um, and we would have to uh, have a commencement order for those powers, but that's in the Scotland Act, so that's going to happen. 
Now, if this list indicates that there's a, 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 an intention for that not to happen, or for the EU um, licensing regime to be established by the UK without a Scottish licensing regime or with a Scottish licensing regime that is absolutely the same as the UK licensing regime, that raises very considerable questions because there is a very different point of view prevailing in Scotland. So they do illustrate areas in which either we have a bafflement about why these are on the list or areas in which there would be a general, genuine disagreement. Now, you know, to, to contextualise the frameworks, and it's quite important this, the UK uh, discussion of those frameworks is about trading and, and barriers to trade. And, and we've indicated there are areas. We indicated in the Scotland's Place in Europe last year, when we published in December, there are areas in which frameworks will be established, and they should be established by means of the, the government sitting down uh, as equals and putting together uh, frameworks in which we would have co-decision making. Uh, and if there are trading issues in there, resolving those. Uh, these, a lot of these issues are not to do with trade. They're nothing to do with trade. The, if you look at the list, uh, there's a very long list of, of legal matters which, for the life of us, we cannot understand why they would, be, they would be there, because there is a separate Scottish legal system. We'd expect to take those matters and operate them here. So the list confuses us a bit, it concerns us a bit, and we want to get much more clarification, which we'll try to get in the meetings with, uh, with Damien Green. What we couldn't agree to is frameworks on all these areas established by fiat of the UK government. Um, that simply wouldn't be possible. Okay, does anybody want to ask any questions on the, what's on the list at the moment before I move on to framework okay. issues? Because, yeah, there you go. Just, just as a supplementary on that, if I may, uh, convener, w when was this list given to the Scottish Government? In July? Sometime in July. Okay. And, it, it, and it, it's not a list, is it, of the areas that the United Kingdom Government intends to, as it were, re reserve? It's, a, it's just a list of um, uh, matters that fall within EU competence. At the moment? Well, we believe in the nature of the list that there's an area which may indicate the areas in which they wish to re reserve, yes, because there is no indication that they don't wish to re reserve them. We've asked repeatedly uh, for a list of those areas that they don't wish to have frameworks in. That they're going to, uh, if, if the existing bill were to operate, we would have uh, orders in council that would free these up. We've had no such indication. So I suppose you could say, on the one hand, we have 111 items here which raises the possibility of them being re-reserved and frameworks. We have nothing in the scales, the other scale, that says these are the ones the United Kingdom government says we're not interested in. But are you are supplementary in this area as well? Specifically about ag agricultural support, because it's causing such a great deal of concern in my constituency, as you can imagine. Um, any change to the support that comes from the EU, we are... Um, we benefit from having more or less favoured area support in this area and we have a great number of um, farmers and crofters in Scotland compared to England. So if we were to switch to, say, for example, a per capita system of funding, that would really disadvantage us. Yes, yes. If US has been very clear about this, you know, decision making, I mean, that's the whole point of devolution is, is you know, subsidiarity is a key issue that here, and the competence of those who understand and know the issues. LFAS, which you raise, is, is a less favoured area status payments, is, is a very important part of that. Uh, there is no LFAS system in England, it's not part of the support system. It is utterly vital. You know, you, you're in the Highlands, in my constituents in Argyll and Butte, there would be no hill farming without LFAS payments. Now, there are other items on this in the agricultural side, for example, the you know, issues of animal welfare and things like that, where you would want to establish a co-decision-making structure. You know, and that would be very sensible to do that. But it has to be done on the basis of equality. These powers come back, and then we sit down and say, look, very quickly say, let's get that structure going, and let's make that structure work. And this is exactly the position that Wales has taken to. You know, we stand absolutely ready to do that. But that has not as yet happened indicated now supplementaries on this issue. Uh, Murdo and then Ivan. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Minister, I'm just trying to understand the, the, you know, the high level concern from, from Scottish Government. There are obviously powers coming down from the EU to the UK. In some areas you feel these should come straight to Scotland. The UK Government feels that because it wants to create common frameworks, it wants to retain some of these at a UK level. But you seem to be going further than that this morning, suggested that there are areas where there are things that we currently in this parliament have control over 
that we would not have control over should the uh, bill as proposed in its draft form go through. Is that, is that your position? There are well, things that would be taken away from this Parliament the, competence. Yes, the competence of the Parliament in agriculture is, is a clear competence. Now, you know, at this point that you're making, Mr Fraser, you know, I've heard from others which said, and, and you know, the UK government has used it, I to say, you won't lose a single power. Now, I think there's two ways in which that's not strictly correct. The first one is that the agriculture, the power to vary, um, you know, agricultural support, if there is a UK-wide framework, will be lost. Without a doubt will be lost if it's a UK framework that's imposed rather than negotiated and isn't co-decision making. Because that co-decision making in the European side means that tw there is a negotiation amongst 28 members uh, which, in which Scotland influences the decision or attempts to, and, and sometimes you know, the UK government isn't that helpful about it, but does attempt to influence that decision making. That will transfer to a single point of decision within the UK government. There has been no proposal to do anything else. Now, you know, if there is a proposal to do something else, we'd like to hear it. We haven't heard it. So there will be a loss there. But there's a larger issue in here that you know, if you were to take this down the road in three, four or five years' time, then we believe that this, the process of this would considerably diminish devolution because the clarity of devolution, that what is not you know, reserved is devolved, will be fragmented. And once that fragmentation starts, it's likely to continue. So we do believe there will be a loss. There will be a tangible loss and there will be an intangible loss. So the, the solution to this, and we'll, I'm sure we'll come on to this in a minute, would be to have common frameworks which are agreed at UK level, which will allow the Scottish interest to be heard as part of UK decision making. Where those are appropriate and necessary, and we would want to discuss whether you know it is appropriate and necessary to do it 111 times, but where those are appropriate and necessary, yes, and, and, and to be set up on the basis, as I keep saying, of co-decision making. Now, you know, the Welsh government not only holds a position, but has gone further in terms of suggesting a way in which this could happen. Published a paper on this some time ago, with some very interesting suggestions. Um, and you know, what we're trying to avoid is to, I suppose, the, a repetition of the failed JMC process. You know, the JMC process does not have co-decision making. It is entirely uh, London-centric. Um, I, I, there is a way forward on this, and that way forward would not be difficult to find. And both the Welsh Government and ourselves are, are clear what that way is. We are looking to have the UK Government accept that, and one part of that acceptance, which we will come on to, is not to put in place a piece of legislation which, in actual fact, would take us further away from that resolution. Coming along. Um, just very briefly from a point of view of, of, of clarification, as I understand it, um, if things stay as they are and the EU withdrawal bill goes through unamended and there's no more clarification on this list and what it means and you've, you've sought that and not had anything back, then what that means is that the UK government would be in a position to unilaterally impose frameworks on these 111 areas which would effectively limit the devolved powers in those areas is that that's the road we're on unless something changes is that correct yes uh, it, it, that is, is so i mean we we can you know go back to the the, the referendum itself in, in june last year and look at what was being said during that referendum uh, and although i rarely quote him with approval uh, let me quote what michael gove said during that campaign uh, in a radio scotland interview in june 2016 hollywood would be strengthened if we left the eu the scottish parliament would have new powers over fishing agriculture over some social areas and potentially over immigration now in reality what this is saying is that there will be no such new powers all those powers will be taken uh, to the united kingdom government will not go to any of the devolved administrations and then, without anything specific, nothing on the face of the bill, uh, there is a, an indication from David Davis in the, in the debate in the House of Commons last week that there will be some transitional process at the end of which some of these powers may be transferred back to the devolved administrations by means of, of a, a orders in council. But there is no time limitation on that. There is no indication of how that will happen. And those that were not would presumably remain with um, no formal Scottish involvement or Welsh involvement in decision making. So those are the problems. Thank you. Yeah, well, in this area. It's on, it's on the well, I was going to come to right. amendments in the amendments and the bigger general picture. Okay. But, but, but we've had quite a bit of discussion around the framework issue. And I know that Adam in particular wanted to open up a discussion on framework. Have we got that right? Yes, I did. So we'll come back to that issue. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you, um, convener. Um, and, and thank you, Minister, for publishing these um, amendments and also for the for the for early sight of them yesterday. I appreciate that. 
Um, and, and thank you also for the way in which they have been presented, because I think you know, the, the grouping them in the way that, they, that you've grouped them help, helps us, I think, to understand what the Scottish Government's and Welsh Government's concerns are. Uh, um, as the convener indicated, I, I wanted to ask about um, how you understand, this is a rather technical legal question, but I, I want to try and understand a little bit more about how you understand the, 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 how, how you understand the relationship between common frameworks and legislative competence. So the Scottish Government have said many times, and you've repeated it, I think, this morning, that um, you accept the need for some common frameworks in some areas. Obviously, you don't accept the need for 111 common frameworks in 111 areas, but you, within that list of 111 powers, you accept that there is a need for some common framework somewhere. And that's welcome, in my, in, in my view. Um, do you accept, then, that... Uh, if there is to be a meaningful common framework, it can't be within the legislative competence of this Parliament to enact legislation that is contrary to such a common framework, and that there will therefore have to be limitations on our legislative competence which don't currently exist. And it's a very important point. I, I think let me start with the issue of, 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 of what that the implication of a common framework is and isn't. A common framework is not, in my view, uh, axiomatically, a framework which t it says that the power is reserved to Westminster. Okay? That shouldn't happen. A common framework is a framework where the partners taking part in, in, the, in whatever structure we have, and I go back to that word co-decision making because I've been using it a lot, it's very important. The partners agree to work together on areas which are within their competence to find a way forward. Now, the area in which would be most interesting here, and you're raising a very interesting issue, is that I suppose the partner disadvantaged in that common framework would be the UK if it did not have any legislative competence itself in that area. So I'm just, I'm just running ahead, slightly ahead of where your argument is. So if we were to agree to an area, a framework, let us, for the sake of argument, say a framework in animal health and welfare. Let's just use that as an example. Then my expectation is that the competence for that would be returned to the Scottish Parliament, to the Welsh Assembly, presumably to the United Kingdom government in terms of England and, and English agriculture, um, and to Northern Ireland, or I, I just I don't want to include Northern Ireland this because you know they don't have an administration at the moment. It would be unfair to do so. And then we would sit down and find a way in which we could operate that uh, those 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 competences uh, in a way that aligned the policies that we were following. So your question would be one I would want. I think I would want to think about carefully in terms of how that would operate within the competences of each of the partners taking part and I think we would have to have a clear understanding in, from each of the partners of how they exercised their legislative competence. It would be I suppose, though I wouldn't push this analogy too far, a, a little like membership of, of the EU itself. You would agree to share your, your so-called, the word sovereignty is wrong here but you see where I'm going to, you would agree to share your sovereignty in order to take part in this. I wondered if Ian, if Ian would want to add something, because it's, it's an important point, and I think we would need to explore it very carefully. I, mean, I think you've covered it very well, Minister. There is a very broad spectrum of approaches to cooperation, from informal cooperation through formal memorandums, through primary and secondary legislation, which imposes some constraints, i.e. a parliament can then only make changes if it subsequently legislates, through to adjustments of competence, either to increase the powers of a parliament or to uh, reduce them. And the existing principles associated with devolution encompass all of those possibilities. Uh, as the Minister has said, um, we are confident that we could enter discussions around frameworks which could give a wide range of certainty to all the partners involved without leaping to a conclusion that it requires an adjustment of competence. Um, but all of these things do require to be discussed and we need to understand the positions of the respective administrations. And, and we shouldn't, sorry, just to add one point, Ian makes a very important point, we shouldn't ignore the existing structures that could be brought into 
to bear upon this. For example, uh, the uh, coordination of policy positions, uh, memorandum, memorandum of understanding, uh, right through to uh, legislative consent being given uh, you know, in a particular instance to the United Kingdom. Um, there are frameworks already or structures already that could be used and we envisage new ones. You asked me a question uh, in the chamber two weeks ago uh, about the uh, question of, of changes to the, the essentially the decision making and power structures within these islands. That is the question that the Welsh Government have helpfully addressed in their paper. And it is one with which we are happy to engage. I would want to see the United Kingdom government engage in that, and that would be a route to progress. Th thank you. That's that's very helpful. So, just to try and understand and distill that and make sure that I've understood it correctly. If there is a common framework between either three or four administrations in the United Kingdom um, uh, on, for example, animal welfare, then presumably that means that all of the administrations who sign up to that common framework or who participate in its, in its negotiation and agreement, agree um, uh, to uh, act in a certain way with regard to um, animal welfare and not to act in a way which is incompatible with that agreed way forward with regard to animal welfare. And so my question is, you know, do, do you think that that will have to be reflected in, in, the, in the legal framework, that's to say in the Scotland Act as amended, or will it be sufficient to have those common frameworks having the, st the status of something that you might call a concordat, going back to language that was used in, in 98-99? And concordat is a good word. Um, it is the Welsh, for example, uh, in their paper, anticipate a sort of system of qualified majority voting in any such arrangements. Uh, you know, that might work on occasion. I think it may be over complex on other occasions. I think my answer, I would only qualify my answer to say I think there's a variable geometry in it, and it's variable according to the subject and the agreement, and I think we can find a number of solutions to it. There will be some solutions that will cover large areas, but the basic point I agree with in the sense that if such a structure exists, those willingly taking part in the structure must accept that they will come to a conclusion which will be binding upon the parties. I accept that. That's a normal part of being in a club, to be honest. If you sign on to be in the, in the club, you should do so. And therefore, we would enter into discussions on those frameworks on that basis. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand how you think the withdrawal bill should be amended to, ref, to reflect that practical reality. Well, in, in the way that we, we, we suggest it be amended, we start with the acceptance that, those, that, that there are no un, new constraints upon the administrations and upon the parliaments. We start with the uh, clear view that those powers coming from Europe come back to the parliaments, and then we willingly enter into discussions on those frameworks. Now, I suppose you might extend your question and say, what happens if the UK government believes there should be a framework and the devolved administrations doesn't? Well, that's a matter for negotiation. One of the problems we have is there is no, presently, trust in the negotiating process. That needs to be re-entered. There needs to be an injection of trust into the negotiating process in which we could then make some progress. And in that spirit, I welcome the discussions that you and, and Jackson Carlo are going to enter into with the Scottish Government, because that might be a, the next step on trying to establish a dialogue. I've got lots more questions, but I think I should probably leave it there at the moment. <laughs> well, that's, that's very good of you. Um, now, uh, there was two people who had, I wanted to ask questions in this hearing. Neil was one of them, because you had issues around the frameworks as well, Neil, have I've got that right? Just, um, it was really relating to the UK single market and the, am and the amendments. Okay. But, um, if, uh, well, you want uh, to do, do with the, 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 the UK yeah. single market thing? Well, it was just, um, obviously there's a desire to protect the, the devolution settlement and also a, a desire to protect the UK single market. Um, can, can you give an assurance that, that support for your amendments does not um, will not create any impediments to trade across the UK and, uh, and put barriers in the way of the UK single market? Uh, you know, there's no intention to do so. I mean, we have our reservations about this description of the UK single market, uh, and I'd be happy to, to, to give you some, some writing on it, which I think, from others, which I think has been helpful in that regard. But, you know, there's no intention to, to, to have barriers to trade, none whatsoever. It's not in our interest, not in anybody's interest. What we're trying to do, actually, is to keep this clear and simple, and you keep it clear and simple by observing the existing devolved settlement. That's fine. 
And you, you, did you still have a, a, a yeah, just, uh, on, on this specific area? Yes, but on frameworks, yeah. <coughs> yeah aye, okay. aye. I, I mean, I suppose it's around about the, 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 the complexity of where this goes, and you've alluded to, to some of that in terms of there's no time limit on the powers that are going back to the UK ministers, effectively, as a consequence of the bill. And also there's powers there that would allow them to change legislation, so would then perhaps <laughs> we're very likely get into a situation where there is less and less clarity as to what is within the competence of the Scottish Parliament and what isn't, um, because this thing evolves over time. And, and actually, if you look down this, this list, there's some issues in here that you would say are, are, are issues that are currently either in the Scottish Government's programme for government or are issues that are considered. I mean, rail franchising, operator licensing, fracking, we've talked about carbon capture, airport noise management, regulation on use of animals. A lot of those are issues that are, that, that are live issues in um, the, the, the Scottish Parliament's consideration at the moment. Do you want to just maybe explain a wee bit more about how that scenario could evolve and what the consequences could be if we end up in that situation where UK ministers are, are tweaking legislation that, that should be within the devolved competence? Well, I mean, I, I think <laughs> the outcomes could be very, you know, d dramatic and, and, and very unfortunate. You know, we have a system that works. You know, I mean, there may be people who do not like devolution. I think, you know, that's quite acceptable. There are people who don't like parliamentary democracy. You know, but we have a system. It operates. Um, it, if we're going to replace that system, you know, and, and that's always a legitimate discussion. People are absolutely entitled to have that discussion and make proposals. They should do so openly. So people say, you know, we don't like the, the devolved system. We don't like the, the, this clarity of, of devolved and reserved. So we're going to put something else in. Fine, let's have that debate. But to do it this way, you know, is in actual fact causing collateral damage to devolution to try and achieve something else. Uh, and we don't believe that that's right or proper and will result in a number of consequences that are dangerous. One of which is just uh, the, 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 the knowledge of those who are operating the system. I mean, if you, if you take the legal ones here, you know, there is a specific Scottish legal system. There are many people working in the Scottish government who are you know, responsible for administering it. Um, if it's being done elsewhere, they will be done by people who don't have a knowledge of it. And that could be very, very damaging indeed. So we, we just think this is not necessary to do it this way. And, and the unfortunate nature of the, of the time we're spending on this is as early as January, uh, you know, I was raising this uh, within the JMC structure. And indeed, I did think that we had an agreement that we would work together to make sure this was done in the right way. Uh, at the JMC plenary in the end of January in Cardiff, I raised this with the Prime Minister, as did the First Minister, and we made it clear that, like all legislation that will require legislative consent, the norm would be that um, officials would work with officials south of the border to develop the legislation in a way that you know, there was not going to be any problems. And nothing happened. Uh, we didn't see, a bit like the Article 50 letter, we just saw nothing. Uh, and then there was an election, and then we kept saying we need to see this bill, you know, because it's getting closer and closer. And uh, eventually we were shown it, I think, um, first or second of... Um, 30th of, 30th of June. 30th of June we were shown it, just, just <clears> after recess, and told it would be published in, in a fortnight. And I had a conversation with David Davis on the phone. Uh, he, he, we both said we'd better sit down and talk about this. I went down to London the, the following week, and, and we had a, a long conversation about it with lawyers present. Uh, we said that uh, we, you know, Clause 11 was a particular difficulty. We thought it should come out of the, the bill, and there should be a placeholder where we discussed how we operate. That didn't happen. We made it very clear that we just couldn't live with this. Not, no changes were made. Uh, now we find ourselves in this position. Uh, we didn't have to be there, and we can get back from there by amending the bill in, in a sensible way and then working out very, very quickly the areas in which we can frameworks are required. And uh, we'll get on and do that. And, and having, uh, uh, Adam Tompkins has indicated, having discussions about how those frameworks are put together and, and, and how they work. A number of years, ministers don't need to touch on things about uh, principles of consent, trade agreements, IGR, the UK position papers, but we've not really got into the detail of your amendments yet, so I think we should probably do that at this stage, because you've obviously sent us that material, and you've just mentioned Clause 11. So I think it's important if we, we understand what the Scottish government's own views are about their own amendments. Um, they need to be made in order for the, the Scottish government what needs to happen in order for the Scottish Government to recommend consent? Which of these amendments are the most critical? Which are the, are the ones which are that you know, th there's potential for discussion around? Um, and in, in the circumstances where the amendments, or not all the amendments, are successful, um, what other 
legislative, non-legislative routes could be used to try to find a way through this? Because I think everyone, including yourself from the language and tone this morning, I think we all want to find a solution to, to this and find a way through it. So if you could just help us map us that, that would be help, helpful to us. I, if I just spend a little bit of time breaking this down to, to say where we are. Um, first of all, in terms of the bill, uh, we're talking about a variety of bits of the bill, particularly about Clause 10 and Schedule 2, Clause 11 and Schedule 3, uh, and some other uh, slightly less important items. The amendments I've set you are, are grouped essentially into five groups. Amendments 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, um, and let me just say what they are. They prevent the powers in the bill from being used to amend the Scotland Act 1998 by the UK government alone. Any changes required to give effect to EU withdrawal or to implement international obligations could only be made either by the bill itself, which requires legislative consent, or by a Section 30 order, which is subject to procedure in the Scottish Parliament. If a change is required to give effect to the withdrawal agreement, that would require the Scottish Minister's consent, and that's for expediency. So we are trying to be helpful. Amendments 4 to 6 mean that the UK government can only use its powers in devolved areas with the Scottish Minister's consent. This amendment would allow the convenience of UK-wide orders when appropriate, but only with Scottish Minister's consent, when using the powers in the bill to make changes which could be made by the Scottish Parliament. Amendments 7 and 8 remove the new restrictions on competence relating to retained EU law in Clause 11. The competence of the Scottish Ministers and Scottish Parliament would therefore be maintained in areas previously regulated by EU law on EU withdrawal. Amendments 9 to 19 remove or modify the restrictions on the Scottish Minister's powers under the Bill. Modifications to directly apply applicable EU law in devolved areas, for example justice or health, could therefore be made by the Scottish Ministers and Parliament rather than exclusively by the UK Government. Requirements for UK Government consent, for example, when a modification to do with quota arrangements are replaced with a requirement to consult the UK Government. And Amendments 20 to 38 are consequential amendments giving full effect to the four major changes in policy set out above. Now, uh, there is then a note which you have which indicates to you the, uh, the, in greater detail uh, what this is about. And this breaks down into um, a number, four particular areas. First of all, in UK ministerial powers. Now, I should stress that we are not saying that we approve of the, the, the UK bill in its entirety. We don't. For example, we do think there needs to be a restriction on UK ministerial powers, and we accept a concomitant restriction and, and framework for operating powers in Scotland. So these amendments are amendments we've agreed with the Welsh Government, which cure the bill for the two governments in terms of our major objections. They don't amend the bill in other ways, which is necessary, charter and fundamental rights, for example. And the political parties in the House of Commons w are all bringing forward lots and lots of other uh, amendments uh, which deal with those matters. We're dealing with the core issues that the Scottish Government views as being, Scottish and Welsh Governments view as being uh, difficult, in fact impossible to accept. On the ministerial powers, the Withdrawal gives, Bill gives UK Ministers a broad and wide-ranging set of powers. We recognise the need for powers given the extraordinary challenges of preparing for EU withdrawal, but these powers uh, shouldn't be used to make fundamental changes to important laws such as the devolution statutes or equality duties. And they must also, because of their breadth, be subject to appropriate higher levels of scrutiny. And we recognise the usefulness of certain instruments being made on a UK-wide basis, where the same or similar changes need to be made to a scheme which operates on a UK-wide basis. But the fundamental principles of parliamentary accountability mean that when changes relate to devolved matters, there must be some mechanism for the parliament to hold the government to account. So that is the, the, the section that, that is the, the, those about ministerial powers. On Scottish ministers' powers, the, the bill limits the Scottish ministers' powers in a number of ways. It prevents Scottish ministers from making necessary changes to an entire category of EU laws, directly applicable instruments. It contains requirements for the Scottish ministers to seek UK government consent before certain types of instrument can be made. These are all inappropriate. The correct, the correct way to divide the powers is according to devolution. If a subject matter is not reserved, the decisions on how the correction should be made are for the Scottish Ministers and for Parliament to make. On Clause 11, Clause 11 is a, a new limitation on the powers of the Scottish Parliament. It means that while the UK Parliament has a requirement to comply with EU law lifted from it, all the matters covered by EU law on exit day are put beyond the powers of this Parliament. Um, the Bill allows the new limitation to be modified by order in Council. This isn't acceptable, since it assumes that where there is to be a common approach across the UK, it is necessary for that subject to be reserved, the point I'm, I've made to Adam Tompkins earlier. 
Uh, neither the Welsh or the Scottish governments can recommend consent to a bill with Clause 11 in it, so it must be removed from the bill, and that is the proper constitutional uh, position. Uh, and uh, as I say, it's a position that both ourselves and the Welsh take. And on the issue of frameworks, the Scottish Government accepts, uh, and we've set it out in Scotland's place in Europe, there may be a need for a common approach across the UK to some matters. These must be agreed, not imposed. They can't be negotiated against the background of Clause 11, since this assumes that where a common approach is required, the subject must be effectively reserved. The UK Government insists that frameworks are needed to protect the UK's single market to ensure the shared management of common resources. We insist that frameworks must respect the principles of devolution, but we accept, and in so doing, the same end will be uh, achieved. So we're laying out what the situation is there. We don't say these amendments are the only way forward. If people come with suggestions that there's a different way to, to achieve the objectives that we have set out, then of course we'll discuss those matters with them. Presently, we are discussing this matter with a, all the political parties in the parliament. We will continue to do so. Uh, uh, the Welsh Government is engaged in the same in, in Wales, discussing this with others, and obviously there is active discussion at Westminster about how these amendments should go forward. The First Minister and uh, uh, the two First Ministers sent these amendments to the Prime Minister yesterday, saying this, this is, we suggest, the way forward, and we await a, a, a response to that. Um, you ask what would happen if the amendments were not made. Well, the first consequence is that there could not be a... Um, a, a, uh, we would not bring forward a legislative consent motion and in those circumstances if the parliament would not give legislative consent we will give the parliament a chance to vote on the issue at some stage of course but th we would hope that between now and the last amending stage of the bill and that is when the legislative consent motion has to be passed there would be a solution found and that last amending stage we don't think would be likely until the turn of the year or even January uh, given the House of Lords situation so there's time for a negotiated set of changes and we're looking for those negotiated set of changes. Um, what happens if that doesn't take place? Well, there are two things. One is legislative consent. If refused, the proper thing under the Sewell Convention is that the parts of the bill should be withdrawn. If they're not withdrawn, then we are in un absolutely uncharted waters. We've spent the last year in uncharted waters, but the, the unchartedness is getting worse, if you put it, th put it that way. Um, the, UK, the Scotland Act makes clear the UK Parliament will not normally legislate on such matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. That's embedded in our practice, and that would be a very serious situation. Finally, we have been considering, as the Welsh Government have been considering, a continuity bill. Um, that's not the best way forward in our view. Uh, there are issues that we could not deal with in a continuity bill. Um, you know, we couldn't repeal the European Communities Act 1972 in a, a continuity bill, nor would we seek to do so, but it would put in place the, the legislative framework that we need to have in place um, if, the, this, if, if, if we are to leave the, the EU. And in those circumstances, we are continuing to consider that as an option as uh, the Welsh Government, and we'll make a decision on it in due course. I think in terms of the, the, the principle of consent round, I think you had some issues and questions around there as well. I hope I've not, um, I've not pulled well, all I'll, that out in terms of that answer. I didn't I'll, mean to. I'll dive in. Um, good morning, uh, Minister. Um, the, the legislative consent memorandum begins by saying the Scottish Government remains of the view that the best option for the UK as a whole and for Scotland would be the one Scotland voted for to remain in the EU. The Scottish Government, as far as I understand it, is still very clear in the view that leaving the European Union uh, is an unnecessary and entirely destructive process. And we clearly all, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament, represent uh, people who by substantial majority voted against that reckless, chaotic, destructive and unnecessary process. Why should there be any circumstances in which you invite this Parliament to grant legislative consent for this bill or in which we give it? I entirely uh, agree with you. You and I have no difference on the matter of the uh, leaving the EU. It is chaotic, uh, unnecessary. It is expending a huge amount of resource, time and effort. Here we are doing it today, which could be better spent in other circumstances. Uh, it's not an edifying spectacle at the present moment. And I am, and you know, you know this because we've had this conversation, I'm a strong believer in, in the importance of the European project and the importance of the peace that has brought to the continent in Europe, of Europe. So uh, I am absolutely in the same position as you are. 
I have to make a distinction between that position and the technicalities which we are going through at the present moment. And I, I make that distinction because I, I think it's still more than likely that the UK will continue on this course. I would hope that it doesn't. And, you know, I'm always looking for a, a change in that. But if it does continue in that course, we will have to have in place the legislative structures to cope with that. Uh, I noticed that uh, Brian Taylor described me last week in a piece as the minister to mitigate Brexit. And I suppose I, I wear that hat as well. I'm not only the, the minister. Sorry? Ask. It is a very big ask, and I think it can't be done. I mean, there is no such no. thing as a good Brexit. I no. mean, I, I got pelters for saying that on LBC, I think, two weeks ago. And um, you know, the, the Express, amongst others, was on my case. But there is no such thing as a good Brexit. I mean, all we can hope for is the least bad Brexit at the present moment. And we do need a le legal structure in place. And we've accepted that from essentially from the beginning, and we've made that distinction. Uh, and the UK government has made that much, much harder. And that's why we're here discussing this. I mean, if the UK government, frankly, was being sensible, in my view, they would have made this process of getting this legal structure in place as easy as possible, uh, and therefore been able to concentrate on what one might call the day job um, of negotiation. And they don't appear to have done so. So I am trying to juggle those two requirements. And I do accept, Mr. Harvey, that, you know, for some people, uh, that's an unacceptable juggling. But I feel that, that very much that, that is the responsibility I have, and that's what I'm trying to do. You say that the best <coughs> we can hope for is the least bad Brexit. Mm. Does that mean the Scottish Government has given up on any hope of opposing this process in principle? No, um, absolutely not. And I think the chances of it not happening, I've said so before at this committee, I think I said so in June at this committee, I think there's still a, a chance it will not happen. And I think that the chaos uh, that is we are presently seeing probably increases that. I mean, extraordinary spectacle of the, of the last week, which is continuing <coughs> of a government in open warfare about crucial issues, I think intensifies that. But I, I have to, you know, one half of me, perhaps more than half of me, has to be idealistic and positive, and I want to, this st to stop. Another part of me has to get the practicalities right, and that's what I'm trying to do. There haven't been many weeks where we haven't seen uh, extraordinary uh, and unprecedented uh, events in, in UK politics. But moving on to that pragmatic uh, argument, um, I'm interested in what you think the implications are of the discussion that happened uh, when you gave your ministerial statement last week. Uh, Jackson Carlo said, uh, I'm ready to meet bilaterally to understand the various remedies and positions uh, and to work where we can to do all that we feel able to do, to do all that we feel able to do, to secure an LCM that the Scottish Government will have confidence in placing before the Parliament. And you welcomed that offer uh, and you agreed uh, to those meetings. What is it that short of everything you've put on the table that would be acceptable uh, in terms of agreeing to recommend to Parliament an LCM? Surely there is, there is no half measure here. Surely the powers which currently reside at European Union, Union either return to Scotland uh, unless they're reserved uh, or there is a, a fundamental abrogation of the devolution settlement? Yeah, I, I, don't, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> I don't disagree with the point you make, but I don't want to preempt discussion taking place. Um, I want that discussion to take place. I thought it was a positive uh, uh, indication from Jackson Carlow, from Adam Tompkins, from almost all uh, the people in the Conservatives who spoke, perhaps one or two hadn't had the memo. But uh, the reality is that we need to have those discussions. It's better to talk about it than not to talk about it. So I'm not going to, I've set no, no preconditions, uh, but when I have these conversations, I will be entirely clear what I think need to be done. I mean, I'm indicated here where I think the problems in the bill are, uh, and they need to be resolved. Equally, I'm ready to talk to many people. You know we've had conversations with, with your colleague, uh, Ross. We've had uh, conversations with Lewis MacDonald. We've had uh, uh, conversations with Tavish Scott. I am very open, and I should have made this offer earlier, but I'm very open to brief the convener and the vice convener of this committee in their roles to make sure that they continue to understand what is taking place. We need an open process. We need as transparent a process as possible, but there will, of course, be discussions I, we would all rather have uh, you know, privately while we try and explore what is possible. So I'm not ruling anything out. You know, my responsibility is to try and make sure that we get this process concluded in a way that is least bad for Scotland, uh, and I'm going to try and do so. 
just just very, very briefly and very finally, uh, I, I would uh, of course accept that there are discussions that will be happening between all the political parties. My party has had a, a discussion with yourself. Opposition parties will talk to, to one another as well. But you say that the process must be open and transparent. I hope you would commit to ensure that any process that leads to the Scottish Government changing its position in order to secure Conservative support uh, and to recommend an LCM is as open and transparent as possible and that the, any changes in your position uh, are discussed on the record with the committee beforehand. I'm, I'm happy to make that commitment. Uh, you know, th this has to be done open and above board. <coughs> we have to have the confidence not just of this Parliament but of the people in Scotland for the actions that we're taking. So uh, I have no difficulty with that at all. But let's have the discussions. Let's not preempt them by you know, saying what we think is going to happen. Them. Let's have them and then let's see where this goes. And you know, it will not be easy. And you know, the history of such discussions between parties in this country and elsewhere is that you know, it's, often, uh, it's never a straight line. But we've got to try and build a process if we're going to make any process, any progress. And I'm going to certainly, uh, I hope to do that with people around this table and others. Thank you. Before we go into other areas, Neil, I think you had some issues around amendments as well, which are that this particular section started off. Have they already been exhausted, or do you want to pick up on it just now? Well, I appreciate what the Minister said about discussions have to take place in relation to amendments. But um, just to confirm, if all the amendments were agreed to, you would consent? Scottish Government would support legislative consent for that bill. Okay. I, I've said that openly. I'm happy to say it again here. Uh, if all the amendments are agreed to, of course, that would happen. If alternatives to the amendments agreed with Wales were found, which achieved exactly what we're trying to achieve, you know, we've laid that out very clearly. Of course, we consider those. But you know, we're, we are trying to find a way through this, and we're trying to do it with other people. I think probably the best place to go now is, is ASH and IGR, because that's all part of th this discussion. Then I'm going to come to Marie and trade uh, agreements, and then Willie, I think your issues are in position papers, so I think that's what we've got left. I've got a couple of things I want to raise myself. So, Ash, on you go. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you about the JMC. So, obviously, the JMC EN hasn't met since February, um, but it was set up originally, its remit was to provide oversight on the Brexit negotiations but also to get agreed outcomes between, obviously, the UK government and the devolved nations. So I know it's due to meet again shortly in October, but has it already failed on its own terms? Uh, you have, you, know, you and your committee advisor, somebody who, who has looked at the JMC process you know, inside out, and <coughs> I think I share her published view that the JMC has not been uh, you know, a, a glittering success in the last 18 years. Um, I perhaps we put too much weight on trying to find a, a development of the JMC that would work. I was a member of the JMC in 2009-10. It's a pretty dismal experience then. It hasn't really changed much. Um, there should be a robust way of ensuring that the, the four parts, the four nations, are able to work together in, in, in the devolved settlement. <coughs> what the JMC essentially is, is a London-centric a structure which is entirely controlled by the UK government. It's very difficult to get, there's no decision-making structure, um, and it's very difficult to get any continuity or progress from it because it's essentially at a whim. I think the UK government has also taken against consulting the devolved administrations. I mean, I think it's become a little bit tiresome, perhaps because the devolved administrations, uh, uh, myself and, and Mark Drakeford and perhaps some of the Northern Irish representatives when they were coming, you know, have been very robust in our views about what is taking place. The uh, terms of reference of JMC EN were clear uh, and agreed, uh, and everybody agreed to them, including the UK government. Um, and they were signed off, I think, at the Downing Street um, meeting that we had uh, at the end of October. And those were broadly twofold. One was to um, seek to f get an agreement on the Article 50 letter, which never happened. The Article 50 letter was never shared with members of the JMC. <coughs> the first Mark Drakeford and I saw of it was just after it was published. And in, you know, I believe that it stopped meeting the JMC in February. February the 8th was the last meeting because it would have become increasingly impossible to have meetings uh, if there wasn't, you know, that quite clearly this was not being tabled. But the second part was uh, to have oversight insofar as it was possible of the negotiations insofar as they related to devolved 
competencies. And given the nature, the, the, the monthly nature of negotiations, both Mark Drakeford and I have, have, have made suggestions of fitting in a JMC meeting into that monthly cycle so that we could receive an update uh, on what had been happening, m uh, look at the next issues, make a contribution uh, to it, uh, and you know, by that means be embedded in what was taking place. Now, that hasn't happened. What has happened is that in the three rounds so far, um, I have been briefed on the first occasion, I think 10 days afterwards, by David Davis, although to be fair, um, uh, Tim Barrow in Brussels gave me a briefing immediately afterwards because I happened to be in Brussels. Uh, during the second round, David Davis gave me a verbal briefing on where things were, and he gave me a briefing on the third round the Monday afterwards. But these are briefings. These aren't, these aren't discussions. These aren't consultations. Um, so we haven't had any meaningful involvement in that. Now, I think that's serious and difficult. And when we get on to the published papers, I think we'll indicate why it's even more serious and difficult, that if negotiations are taking place on matters of devolved competence, which this parliament is responsible for, you know, it may not be possible for the UK government to deliver commitments made uh, if they don't actually talk to the devolved administrations. Uh, so I think there are serious issues in this, but there are also issues of due process. This is, you know, th th there is a constitution. It may not be a written constitution, but there is a constitution. The law has established these parliaments. These are part of the structures of these islands. You can't pretend they don't exist. Um, but actually, that is essentially what is happening. And we need to ensure that we find a way of reminding people <laughs> that the devolved administrations do exist, and they have responsibilities, and they need to be integrated into this. Mark and I have made detailed suggestions about how the JMC should go forward. We've also made it clear that you can't, you can't bilaterally decide on the future of a multilateral structure. So there needs to be a meeting of the JMC to take this forward. And that there is now a meeting of the JMC which is scheduled to take place on the Monday the 16th of October. And of course I will tell the committee after, afterwards what has taken place. Um, we hope that that will start the monthly cycle again. We hope we'll get a clarity on how it's going to operate. Um, and we will find out um, on the day. If it is like the previous ones, then you know, I'm afraid we'll be depressed again. If it's not, and there's a commitment to change things, then I think we'll be quite pleased. Yeah, so just to clarify, you, in June, you sent a joint letter, um, yourself and Mark Drakeford, and you mentioned that just now, that to, you know, suggesting a reset, making practical suggestions for how things could be improved. Did you get a reply to that letter? Um, I think we've had a number of replies, but I'm not sure any of them have addressed the points. Um, uh, uh, the new chair of the JMCEN is to be the first secretary. secretary. Uh, so he's now, I think, thinking about it. I think he's been reminded of, of that particular letter. It is an important point. We haven't laboured it. It's an important point, but the UK government is now in breach of the me Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, they had, I think, four weeks, am I right? Uh, they had four weeks to either um, have a JMC or to call one um, as a result of Mark and I, um, I think I'm right in that, yeah, uh, right of Mark and I asking for one, and it hasn't happened well. Obviously, it didn't happen in that period of time. I think we asked for it on the 14th of June. Uh, you know, we're well beyond those four weeks. So, uh, even technically, they are now in breach of, of the Memorandum of Understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, trade agreements, Marie. Um, thank you. Um, there's obviously a real need to strike trade deals in the future when we're leaving the EU. And I think probably to bring some clarity to it, I'll, I'll focus on agriculture again because it's an issue of importance in my own constituency. It's an issue of the items that are on the list. But agricultural subsidy, for example, can be a real bone of contention when you're striking a, a trade deal. And uh, over the last week, there's been a little more clarity around um, the UK government's um, statements on that, that they why that they want to retain powers over agriculture. And Lord Duncan has m given some signals that he would like to look to a less protectionist future in terms of trade deals. Clearly, that causes us a great deal of concern in, in my area. <laughs> um, it, what, is it possible that trade deals could be struck <coughs> at a UK level? without us having any input into that. It appears that the 
uh, Trade Secretary Liam Fox does not wish the devolved administrations anywhere near uh, the issue of trade deals. Um, I suspect in the collective mind at Westminster is, is, is shudder at what happened over the um, CETER treaty and the role of um, semi uh, sub-state parliaments, and particularly the Flemish parliament, which took exception to certain of the details and was required to ratify it, of course. Um, we, have, we should remember that the withdrawal bill at Westminster is the first of several bills that will take place, one of which is a trade bill. So you know, we, we don't actually know the, the, the content of that trade bill yet, but I'd be pretty supply, surprised if it you know, was generous towards the devolved administrations. And there is a concern. There's a concern about subsidy, and, and quite rightly so. I mean, Michael Gove keeps sending confusing messages about what he thinks. Um, there is no question, you know, hill farmers of the West, uh, you know, they require support that the, the agriculture is, you know, as you know, crofting has always been uh, about how people live on the land as, uh, as much as about producing about produce there are whole issues that are not relevant to elsewhere so there are those required to be addressed but there's another issue too which is you know you you probably need control of agricultural policy if you are you know we could use the chlorinated chicken example but let's use hormone beef and let's use brazilian beef as an example you know, Brazilian beef has not been admitted uh, into the EU. There's a lot of reasons for it. Some are to do with hormone feeding. Some are to do with the environmental nature of its production. You know, if you're going to have that deal with Brazil, I would think beef is pretty near the top of the, 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 the list for them. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do that with the willing consent of the farming community in Scotland. I'm absolutely sure of that. And I think the Scottish Parliament would be very, have severe reservations. So you may well want to make sure that they are nowhere near this, this deal. Now, you know, I am publicly very sceptical about this idea of the glorious Brexit, as I think Boris Johnson puts it, with this buccane these buccaneering trade deals all over the world. I, you know, I, I do think, to use the beef analogy a bit further, it's mince. But that being, that being the case, you know, even if that were true, they would have to have control of these things. So we should be very aware of that. Uh, you know, and we should also be aware of the reality of some of this rhetoric. Uh, you know, the, Juncker's... Um, State of the Union message talked about new trading arrangements they were establishing with Australia and New Zealand. You know, uh, the, the EU is already in there, it's already doing the things. And if you look at the much vaunted Indian trade deal, which didn't happen, you know, the real barrier to the Indian trade deal has always been, even in the EU terms, the UK uh, and the issue of migration. So, you know, unless the attitude to migration changes, then some of these deals are simply impossible. So I am a skeptic on all that. But I'm a worried sceptic in terms of what it may mean in terms of, of some of these powers. Okay. I would agree with you. I mean, we have real concern about agricultural subsidy, real concern about animal welfare standards and the quality that that impact that that might have on food. Another area that there have been concerns about in the past that's not really clear in all this is the NHS. So there's a very different um, system in the NHS in England where there's much more... Um, private um, company involvement. And I see on this list um, public sector procurement. And I just wonder, is that, you know, is there going to be... A, a, we've, we've protected our NHS in Scotland from um, private companies uh, coming in and running our hospital wards or our maternity services. Does, is there a possibility that that could open up? Yeah, I mean, you're opening up a, a really wide area on this list, uh, which, which sort of, the path into it is this, uh, and, we, and we should certainly consider this. Uh, first of all, where there is EU regulation, some people you know, resent that regulation, and you can understand that regulations are always difficult. So if you were to abandon that regulation, then you would need a different regulatory structure. The view of what that regulatory structure might be will, may well be different you know, in terms of the NHS uh, between Scotland and England. But if these powers are taken only to the UK, then Scotland's view of what that structure would be, even if it does not like the, UK's, the EU structure and wants a different one, would be decided upon by the UK. And that's one of the big issues in the transfer of these powers. You may be dealing with you know, a decision made by the 28 with which people in Scotland and certain sectors may disagree you would then be dealing with a decision by one, right, with which you may well also disagree. 
So there doesn't seem to be such much benefit in so doing. And public sector procurement in the health service would be one of those issues. You may find some things in the European directives to be unduly onerous or burdensome. Uh, you, know, you might then find that what the UK government wants to do with this is equally unacceptable. Uh, the ability of Scotland to influence that decision would be lost. Thank you. Um, Willie, I think you had some questions around UK position papers, and I'd like to get some, then c begin to come to a conclusion on the Parliament's role in scrutiny of Scottish government ministers, if you don't mind. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Minister, could I just open up a little bit of conversation about these UK position papers that appeared, I think it was in August? Uh, Mr Juncker even said none of them were satisfactory. So was there any involvement with the devolved administrations in the framing of these position papers? Roughly, what are they about? And uh, have we got any opportunity to even influence them at this stage? Uh, no, <laughs> there's been no involvement. You will have seen a letter. I think you've been copied a letter I've written to David Davis about the papers. We've now had, um, as of the 19th of September, we've had 15 papers, seven position papers, seven future partnership papers, and a technical note on implementation of the withdrawal agreement. Now, you know, we've looked at all those papers. We've provided you with an analysis of, of those up until the date of the, the, the letter. We can continue to do so. But I, I think we were getting increasingly concerned by these papers. I mean, all of them, the interesting thing about them, the first thing interesting thing is that many of them, in fact, all of them, contain pretty strong and convincing reasons for staying in the EU. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't like to suggest at any stage that the civil service is um, subversive, but if you were to take a sort of common view of them, you might think that there was a sort of hidden message coming through here. But then, when you look at them, you know, some of them deal with areas of devolved competence, and there's been no discussion at all. What happens is the same as what has been happening in terms of the negotiations. Uh, you know, you will get told that these are coming out. In fact, we get told about 24, 48 hours beforehand. Um, you, you know. A copy will be shared, um, and my colleagues will be asked what they think of it. But uh, you know, they, they don't have any input to it, and they can't say, well, actually, don't have page two, paragraph three, because it doesn't work. They're just published. Now, where this, this is impolite, I would have said, to say the least, I also think we could help you know, put on some issues. Um, you know, the one on migration was actually an options paper. And we could actually say, well, here's some other options, you know, one of which is I, I did a, took part in a very interesting event last night organised by the IPPR and the Royal Society, in which Jackson Carlos spoke and I spoke and Paul Sweeney spoke. And there was a, a, quite a strong measure of agreement on the need for a, a more flexible uh, migration policy for Scotland and the reasons why that should be the case. We could have injected that into it. It didn't happen. When it gets really serious is where areas of devolved competence are dealt with without any consultation of this. Because if these papers are being read by negotiating team and others, the assumption must be, no matter what you think of them, that this is authoritative and whatever in them can be delivered. But we don't know whether it can be delivered or not because we've not been consulted and we don't know as a parliament whether we can do these things. We've not been asked to do them. So there is a sort of false prospectus being put forward here and, and people need to know that. Now, the right way to do this is to talk to us about these papers, to have a conversation. It doesn't have to be lengthy. You know, show us a draft of the paper two weeks beforehand and we'll say what we think and, and we'll put some ideas in. That's, we're happy to work like that. We're very flexible. We're actually much more flexible than, than many other uh, similar administrations. But we don't get the opportunity to do so. And, and that's, as I say, not just impolite. It's actually quite dangerous in terms of assumptions being made. Some of the papers are also thin. I think uh, David Edward gave evidence last week to the uh, European Committee, mm -hmm. in which he said, I think on one in particular that he had been offered to as an undergraduate essay, he would have failed it. Uh, you know, but uh, I, I think that there is the opportunity to get this a little bit better uh, if we were involved. Are European colleagues aware of Scotland's view in these papers that our voice is not represented. We, you know, we will continue to make the point in conversation and discussion. We have a very effective representation in Brussels. Our ministers are there and meeting people regularly. Uh, I'm in Brussels next week, and we will continue to, to make the point. In broad terms, where do you think we are in terms of the, the three key negotiation points for progressing to the next stage of negotiations on citizens' rights, the financial bill, financial support, and the Irish border question. Do you think there's sufficient progress being made there? Well, I'll be a judgment that the 
the, the, the Commission and the Parliament will have to make in, in the coming weeks. I think a great deal will hinge on what the Prime Minister says on Friday. I think the, the, the expressed concern that in some way there's something unfair about the sequencing of the talks rather ignores the fact the UK signed on to the sequencing of the talks and did so willingly in June. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be dismissive. I think you know, quite clearly the view is that progress is being made on some areas and not on others. Uh, on some areas, the, there are areas which will be impossible to progress with the present attitudes. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure it helps greatly to speculate on it, except to say there, there are issues on which we have agreed with the UK government, issues on which we've disagreed with the UK government. On migration, we've been quite clear about that disagreement. We think it's very important to say that. On other issues, such as the budget, we haven't said that because we're not sure it helps very much. Um, and we'll, we'll wait to see what takes place. Um, you know, we accept there will be a legal obligation to, to pay monies. And we don't accept that there is £350 million a week waiting to come back to the National Health Service. But, you know, we, we do want to see progress made. But we don't think it's going to be made the way it's being made at the moment. But what the Prime Minister says on Friday and what's the outcome of that, we wait and see. I mean, again, we don't know what she's going to say. You know, I mean, we are 48 hours from it. Uh, you know, like the Lancaster House speech, we have no idea what's going to be in it. We won't know until she says it. You know, and there's a sense in which you think that's not particularly helpful. Well, all 27 members of the European Council have to agree, as I understand it, before progress can be made. And the, one of the key questions, of, clearly, for the Irish government is the Irish border issue. Yes, I heard Simon Coveney speak in Cambridge uh, uh, two weeks ago uh, at the British Irish Association dinner. And uh, you know, he was very clear about it. I mean, he thinks the progress that needs to be made, and he was open about this, is is a customs union uh, which requires to take place. He doesn't believe it can be done without a customs union, and he believes that the right position for the UK is continuing membership of the single market. I think that is a minimum that we should look to, not as transition, but as destination. Uh, you know, and and I, I think that that is what I would want to hear. But you know, this will be an issue. We've been very clear. The Irish situation is not one which anybody should dabble in. You know, we recognise and respect the process that will be taking place, and nothing should put at risk the, the, what has taken place through the Good Friday Agreement. Now, you know, there is a guarantee in the common travel area. That's extremely important. Uh, it is much more difficult than some of the speculation puts in place to establish a, an open, uh, seamless border. And the only way that can really be done, the only way it can be done, is with a customs union. Thank you. Thank you, Ollie. Can I bring the focus back to our Parliament now? Because, Minister, you made a very welcome commitment in your LCM statement to the Chamber last Tuesday, that you will work with the Parliament and its committees, agree a set of principles and processes around the legislative issues as far as this Parliament's concerned. I think it would be helpful if you could say a bit more uh, about what your thinking is in that area, because it's obviously very important to this committee that we're able to scrutinise what you do appropriately. Um, I want to be as, as open and as helpful as I can be, and I've said, convener, and I repeat this, I'd be very happy to keep you, uh, yourself, and, and the vice convener, and the wider committee, of course, briefed as, as the process goes ahead. Um, if we plan out from where we are, we might understand what could take place. You are considering the legislative consent memorandum, and you will, no doubt, uh, report upon that. Um, I, I would hope that the discussions that are taking place between the parties would lead to a common position on the amendments that are required. That would be my objective. I don't know whether it can be achieved, but that would be my objective. If that is the case, and if that also, uh, you know, I make this point, it also applies in Wales. We are you know, working very closely with Wales. But we can't envisage a situation for which Scotland would be content and Wales wouldn't be, or vice versa. So provided that were to take place, uh, then you know, I think if we have a guarantee of that from the UK government, that the amendments will be taken and accepted, then we have moved forward and, and essentially we can bring forward a legislative consent motion and will. If we don't get that progress, then quite clearly we're involved in a process of, of the House of Commons attempting to amend. Uh, we will, of course, support you know, our colleagues in the House of Commons um, and we hope other parties will do so too and work with us. And we offer you know, very much the opportunity to work together on the limited number of amendments which we've agreed with, with Wales to see if we can get that amending process underway. During that entire process, uh, I am very welcome, the welcome committee scrutiny. We will also then move, if we can get agreement on these amendments, we'll also then move into issues such as how we might, uh, the powers that the Scottish ministers have might properly be supervised through a framework or whatever. Now, we are open to that discussion. 
You've written to me about issues of secondary legislation. I think we need a, an active discussion between officials and this committee and your clerks about how we could bring together a proposal on that scrutiny. Very happy parties to, to bring together those proposals. I commit myself to a, a framework for scrutiny in that way if we can come to one. Um, and also we need to look at things like the Charter of Fundamental Rights. However, if all this, that doesn't work, then we're into the process of a continuity bill, perhaps, and that would be a different process, and I'd come back to the committee and explain how we were going to take that forward. And that would be a bill, so there would be the additional work that is required by a bill. Thank you, Minister. That was a very helpful evidence session for the committee in getting an initial understanding of your thinking. The committee will now take written and all of evidence over the next couple of months, and we expect to publish our interim uh, views on the LCM before the Christmas recess. We will then aim to publish a final report, all things being equal, before the last amending stage in the House of Lords sometime in the new year. And that ends this particular session with the Minister this morning. Again, I thank you and your officials, and I suspend the meeting now to allow for a change of witnesses.
Colleagues, the, the second item on our agenda is to discuss the Budget Process Review Group's final report with two external members of the group. We are joined today for that item by Carolyn Garner, the Auditor General for Scotland, and Dr Angela O'Hagan from Glasgow Caledonian University. Another external member of the group, Professor James Mitchell, had hoped to join us today, but unfortunately he's unable to be here and he's passed his apologies to the committee. Now, before we open up the session, I wanted to put on record the committee's gratitude to all members of the group for their incredible efforts in producing such a wide-ranging and high-quality report in what uh, is a, was a very challenging timescale that they were presented. And I know there were elements came into your thinking halfway through it as well, such as the change of the autumn budget date, etc., which, which I'm grateful for you dealing with all that turbulence. I know that the external members of the group in particular played a key role in formulating the recommendations aimed at improving our budget scrutiny processes, uh, and particularly in the light of these changing circumstances, and thank them all for the contributions. I believe that the group has provided a positive example of Parliament, the Government and civic society working together, and something that we should be applauded, and hopefully we can serve as a model for similar initiatives in the future to try to find successful way forwards. But just so the committee is absolutely clear, and I'm sure you know that from the report yourselves, the proposal in the report will take some time to implement, and there are elements which will stretch over a number of years, particularly in relation to fiscal framework issues, etc., and the budget and the, uh, the block grant adjustment process. Um, but it so this will not in any way be able to be implemented for the scrutiny of the budget process for 2018-19. So, so just to set the context of where we are, and to begin the discussion today, and the, sorry, sorry, yes, uh, Clark's quite rightly reminded me before I go to James, you were going to make a couple of opening statements. So forgive me, I would have been premature there. So I, I don't know who wants, wants to go first, but you both, I think, wanted to make a short opening statement. Thank you, convener. Um, I'll be brave, brief, but we thought in the light of the shift between your first agenda item this morning and where we are now, it would be helpful just to set a bit, bit of context. Um, so on behalf of the members of the Budget Process Review Group, thank you for inviting us to provide evidence on our final report. As you know, we were established to review the budget process in the light of the new tax raising powers um, and spending powers being devolved to the Parliament at the moment. We published our interim report in March, which highlighted what we saw as being the key issues for a revised process, and we included questions for consultation. The final report reflects the breadth of contributions from members of the group, but also from the external stakeholders we engaged with during our work and those who responded to that consultation. Um, and in agreeing our findings, we reflected on both the existing budget process and the implications of financial devolution, which is fundamentally changing Scotland's public finances. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who did contribute their views. Um, and I think it's um, very clear that the range and quality of the contributions that we got really do reflect the growing level of interest there is in Scotland's budget as we move into this new phase. So based on the detailed work that we've done over the last year, there are four key things that we think the revised process should do. First of all, we think it should enable Parliament to have greater influence on the formulation of the budget. It should increase transparency and raise public understanding of the budget and the way that the new powers are being used to make important choices. It should respond effectively to the new fiscal arrangements and the wider policy challenges that the Parliament and Government face, and most importantly, lead to better outcomes for the Scottish people. To achieve this, we consider that significant changes to the, the existing budget process are needed, and we've made a package of recommendations to this effect. We recommend a framework for a revised process that includes a continuous cycle of scrutiny throughout the year, where committees can explore the impact of budgetary decisions and look to influence the formulation of the budget before the government sets out its firm spending proposals. We think that parliamentary scrutiny should be evaluative with an emphasis on what budgets have achieved and aim to achieve over the longer term, looking at where money has actually been spent and raised and the outcomes and outputs being achieved. It needs a long-term outlook, building up evidence over time and focusing more explicitly on prioritisation within the fiscal constraints that we will always experience um, and making sustainability a key consideration. And scrutiny needs to recognise the independent nature of many of the policies uh, which the budget is seeking to deliver. 
Our recommendations look to enable this. They build on the principles identified at the time the Scottish Parliament was established and reflect an ambition for a world-class approach to managing the public finances to meet the challenges of today and the future. We recognise that this will mean cultural change as well as changes to processes and procedures and that this will take time to work through, as you say, convener. Given the complexity of the issues, some of the recommendations will need to be phased in over time. We expect there'll be a, an opportunity to introduce most of the changes proposed as we look towards the 2019-20 budget cycle, with the publication of a medium-term financial strategy for the first time before the 2018 summer recess. We'd also expect some aspects of the budget process to continue to evolve during the current parliamentary session as these new approaches bed in. Convener Angela just wants to add to that from her perspective before we move on to your questions. Thank you, um, Caroline. And thank you very much, Convener and members, for your invitations. And again, on behalf of the group, thank you very much for your very gracious comments on the process and, and report. The budget review process was indeed a, a positive exercise with a, a shared commitment on the part of the group's members, but as you've said significantly on the part of Parliament and Government to meet challenges and to, to come up with, to advance a practical and responsive and progressive budget process. And core to that process is the commitment to embed equality analysis throughout the process. And by, through the recommendations to increase parliamentary scrutiny, there's greater opportunities to um, embed um, equality analysis. The expanded budget process gives a greater emphasis on evidence around outcomes, impacts, and um, the proposals that we've put forward do create more access and entry points for equalities scrutiny. The Scottish budget process already is well ahead of anywhere else in the UK. Um, and most of Europe in terms of equality analysis, or at least the process to allow for greater equality analysis. And so there's opportunity to build on that pioneering work um, with the equality budget statement and increased committee scrutiny. And as Caroline says, to create a world-class approach to equality analysis within the budget process. And I just wanted to um, emphasize that significant and um, distinguishing feature of the Scottish budget process and the budget review process and report. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Angela. James. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, convener. And thank you for coming along this morning and also for the, the very detailed work that you've put into your report. Uh, I realise that it's been a, a challenging issue, but you've carried it out uh, very seriously. Um, one of the, the issues that you know we're obviously looking at in, in recent times the, the budget process has been, you know, a curtailed one because of, to, to a certain extent, because of external factors beyond the control of this parliament. Um, and there's a bit of frustration about the amount of time we've had to properly consider that. And one of the things that you've looked at uh, going forward is producing an approach which involves looking at a, an almost like a, an all year round budget process and also a longer term view, so that rather than simply looking at the the budget in the, the coming year, uh, you know, politicians and interest groups, you know, take a much longer term uh, look at the factors affecting the budget and therefore we produce a much more robust and qualitative process. One of the key factors around all of that is data available to, to people to be able to, to make proper assessments. So what in, in terms both of the all year round budgeting approach and also uh, a longer term approach, what data do you envisage being available to parliamentarians and stakeholders in the, the, the year running up to the budget and also for the longer term? So a really good question, um, and I'll kick off if I may. Um, I think we absolutely recognise, first of all, the challenge that Parliament has had over the last few years in trying to scrutinise the Scottish Government's draft budget in a very short period of time, um, which also happens uh, around the um, Christmas holiday, so um, time is squeezed in all sorts of ways. And the focus of the budget itself tends to be a fairly short-term time period. Um, and our view as a group was that that's tended to focus attention on the numbers that are changing at the margins, um, 
rather than on the overall um, bulk of 33 billion or so which is being spent and what it's achieving. So we spent a lot of time looking, first of all, at the question of timing, and I'm sure you'll want to talk a bit more about that this morning, but also about how we can help Parliament or make suggestions that will help Parliament and its committees to pull back and look at the budget as a whole rather than being squeezed into looking at the, the numbers which are catching the headlines that year for particular reasons. One of the benefits we think there will be of a longer term approach is that committees can, over the life of a parliament, um, agree the areas they're most interested in um, because of uh, demographic pressures, because of policy challenges, because there are signs that the money isn't keeping up with demand in various ways or that there are better ways of spending it, and build up their evidence from there. Some of that evidence will come from simply having more time to look at trends, looking back the way at what's been spent and how that's changed, and looking forward to things like how demographic changes will affect demand in future, and health and social care is an obvious example there. But it's also a chance to draw in um, evidence from a wider range of stakeholders, including audit reports from Audit Scotland, um, academic research, and I think very importantly the views of people who um, rely on and use the particular public service themselves to really drill down and build up that understanding um, in ways that can help to improve the scrutiny of the budget, but also, as we say in our recommendations, um, influence the way government formulates its budget and the sort of proposals it brings forward every year. Now, the sort of data that's available will be different in each of the different policy areas you look at. Um, I know this committee is um, having a close look at economic statistics and indicators, and that will obviously be key for some of the tax proposals coming through. But in areas like education, health and social care, the information you need will be quite different and will be drawn together from different sources but that longer term cycle we think gives you the chance to identify what data you need to start to pull it together and to start to see what what it means for you Angela do you want to add to that um, in the in the report we talk about um, the basket of evidence um, that needs to be and is there to be brought into play um, to assist in in year-round scrutiny, and that that would include um, everything that Caroline has said, and we've tried to um, you know, give a, a graphic depiction of that to point to the range of background documentation there is, um, including things, um, as Caroline has said, audit reports, but the reports that are generated, the data that is generated across the agencies responsible for uh, dispersing public finance, um, and included in that, the data and reporting mechanisms around the public sector equality duty, so the mainstreaming reports and outcome reports that are produced there that give an indication of the impacts of changes in resource allocation or changes as a result of public service reform or service reconfiguration, etc. So to be looking at a wider range in that expanded time frame. Um, there's also, again in the report, um, the, the emphasis on a greater hookup between assessing and evaluating outcomes from publicly funded activities um, as assessed through the National Performance Framework and the data that goes behind that. Um, so again, interrogating and drilling down into what's behind the National Performance Framework um, and making closer links between um, budgetary proposals and subsequent evaluation through the, the Performance Framework. You both identified um, a lot of different information sources which can be used in terms of identifying trends and helping with policy choices. Um, one of the things I'm interested in, it, it, there are private sector and public organisations out with the Parliament that to take a longer term view would produce a business plan and produce like a five year forecast, which would give, you know, on a year by year basis, at least at a very high level, uh, what the overall numbers look like. We don't currently have that. Um, in terms of the Scottish Government in relation to the medium term financial strategy, is that something that you think is achievable to, to produce? Because although all the different information sources you've identified are very helpful, you know, ultimately the overall numbers and the data is, is going to be critical to the political decisions that are going to be made. I think as a group we felt that the medium term financial strategy was one of the key elements of the package of measures that we are proposing um, and it's one of the things that helps to compensate for the, the continuing shorter period of time for focusing the detailed budget proposals each year. 
Um, that's the thing that will set the context for the budget each year. Um, it will be looking at the economic forecasts, the demographic forecasts, the other things that are expected to change alongside current policies and the ways in which they will um, be uh, affecting uh, demands on the public finances as well. Um, it will also be looking at the level of taxes which are expected to be raised from each of the devolved taxes and also demand-led spending on the new social security powers in particular. Um, and uh, setting out clear policies and principles for the way in which new powers like the borrowing powers and reserve powers will be used within the overall framework. There's no doubt that it will be challenging for government to produce that for the first time. It will be a new element of our um, fiscal arrangements here in Scotland. Um, but we think, first of all, it is possible for it to be done um, next summer, before the summer recess in 2018, to inform the 2019-20 budget cycle. And secondly, more importantly, that it's critical really for making this longer term um, more strategic scrutiny of the public finances effective it's that that lets you move away from a focus on the individual numbers that are changing to the bigger context and the things that the budget's trying to achieve actually the way they described it at paragraph 81 and the four particular elements in your report and just for the records and, and also for those who are tuning in to, so they can understand clearly what that mid-term financial strategy will contain these four elements were forecast revenue and demand-led expenditure estimates from the Scottish Fiscal Commission and their effect on Scottish public finances, the broad financial plans for the next five years, clear policies and principles for using and managing and controlling the new financial powers, and scenario plans based on economic forecasts and financial information in order to assess the potential impact of different scenarios on the budget. Now, that follows through on some of the things we, as a committee, were asking for, actually as part of the discussion on last year's budget. So I, was, I thought it was very powerful. Sorry for reading that out, James, but it just sets the context for the wider people who are listening in. Sorry, when you go. Sure, I think that's, that's helpful. Just um, finally, obviously what this requires is a, a change in culture from you know, a situation over recent years where the, the budget has been looked at over a very short time scale to uh, looking at it all year round and also taking a longer term view. What do you think is required in order to make that successful so that politicians and stakeholders are able to understand the new process and engage with it effectively? Um, it's a, a kind of challenging or a difficult term maybe to use culture change and to use it in a way that doesn't sound like being critical. But I think certainly our view within the group was it, it's about it has to be seen in the context of the recommendations for a more expansive and extended process, whereby the focus is, and, and we focus very strongly on this in the report, is on outcomes. What difference is public sector, um, is public funding making in the key areas of government? And if, if a budget is, as we say from a kind of equalities budgeting perspective, if the budget is the principal expression of a government's priorities, so how then are those priorities being met through public spending? And that's what we want to encourage greater, you know, the scrutiny to be over the longer term, rather than the immediacy of the politics of budgeting, but looking at the longer term impacts and outcomes that are achieved through the consensus that ultimately is the agreement of, of, of a budget and will be the agreement of um, the medium term financial strategy and the, the multi-annual budgets, which again allow for setting that consensus for setting that strategic direction for public spending and the outcomes that we collectively, you know, informed through improved public engagement, um, want to see achieved as a consequence of the dedication and allocation of, of Scotland's resources. So to look to what, what differences are being made to advance the well-being and equality of, of people in Scotland. And so to shift maybe um, some of the budget scrutiny from the immediacy, immediacy of you know, political point scoring around indicators and targets, but to look um, more longer term and more in depth at what kinds of changes are happening and where um, adjustments might be more effectively made. I'd add just a couple of brief points to that. Um, first of all, I think um, there's something for all of us involved in this about accepting that the new uh, fiscal framework, the new devolved tax and spending powers, mean that they will, will inevitably 
inevitably be more uncertainty in the budget than there has been in the past, that forecasts are never going to be right in the narrow sense, um, and the fact that more tax or less tax has been raised in a year than was forecast isn't necessarily an indication of failure. It's that sense of how we manage the uncertainty and the volatility as a whole. The second is a, a strong theme in our report, which is about greater transparency um, of, of information across the whole of the public finances and looking at how those things join up um, and doing things to make sure that transparency is useful to people in Parliament and to people across Scotland. Um, we make a recommendation about in the budget documentation separating the presentation of the numbers from the political presentation of them. Um, I know there was concern in some committees last year about the way some elements of the budget were presented. I think if we can strip away that confusion between the numbers and their presentation politically, it helps people to focus on, as Angela has been saying, the numbers and what they're intended to achieve, rather than whether this number should be 50 million higher or lower, depending on which definition you use. That doesn't help anyone, and it tends to get caught up in, in the very narrow political street fighting rather than the bigger decisions that are needed around the budget. Okay, thank you. Probably Murdo means revisions is in that area that we've just been hearing about, so you want to... Pick up on that. Yeah, thanks, uh, Convener. G good morning. Um, and just as a precursor to, to my question, if I could just echo what the Convener had to say about the report, I think is excellent. And uh, uh, in particular, I think the emphasis on evaluation of outcomes and outputs is exactly where we want to be going. So I think it's, it's been very valuable. Um, I've got a specific question around the question of budget revisions, which you do touch in paragraphs 184 to uh, 186 in the, the report. There's a specific scenario that came up during our budget scrutiny for the, for the current year, which perhaps if I just narrate by way of illustration might be helpful to put this into context, the, the budget was presented to Parliament on, if I remember rightly, the 15th of December uh, last year. At that point, the, the Finance Secretary told us this was every, every pound was, was accounted for in the budget. Um, the uh, opposition parties were challenged if they wanted to propose alternatives to the budget, they would have to say where the extra money uh, was coming from. And that draft budget was then put out to the various subject committees for, for scrutiny. Uh, it was only uh, six weeks later, um, and that period, of course, included the, the, the Christmas and New Year uh, break, that uh, the, the Finance Secretary came back to Parliament for stage one, at which point he'd done a deal with Mr Harvey's party and had found an extra £220 million in order to uh, agree this particular deal. And there were a lot of jokes at the time, of course, about the, the finance secretary so far and how he found this money wedged down the back. Um, but the more serious point was, I thought the two more serious points were, firstly, had the opposition parties been aware that, that the budget was understated on the 15th of December, that would have put a different uh, complexion on any negotiations that took place. And also, uh, the, the committees of this parliament who were scrutinising the budget were scrutinising the budget that was £220 smaller than it was in reality. So I, I'm wondering if this is an issue that you considered uh, looking at uh, the question of budget revisions or whether you came to any view on how in future we might improve, improve the, uh, the scrutiny process and provide greater transparency. Um, you won't be surprised, I guess, to hear that it was an issue we spent some time considering and, and actually the broader question of amendment powers and whether Parliament should have amendment powers over the budget as presented um, by government. Um, there are arguments both sides. Um, we heard um, examples of legislatures elsewhere that do have various sorts of amendment power, either general within the overall cap of the resources that are available or none at all, which is clearly where Scotland is at the moment. Um, and we thought quite hard about the pros and cons of that. I think it didn't take us very long to rule out the idea that unrestricted amendment powers are generally not a good thing, um, that you end up with um, the risk of pork barrel politics and fiscal sustainability tends to go out of the window. But we thought long and hard about whether it should be possible for um, opposition parties to propose amendments within the overall cap that had come forward. And actually, the more we thought about it, the more we thought that actually that really throws up the same question that you're um, raising, that we, what's important is that everybody is clear what the overall um, envelope of resources is in ways that are complete and transparent. Um, I had a patch um, earlier this year where I would um, have small bets with colleagues 
to um, test whether they could tell me where the extra 200 million odd came from or not. Um, and very few people understood that because, first of all, the budget that is currently presented doesn't tell you the whole picture. And secondly, the process that we currently have um, doesn't require that explanation of where the movements are happening. Um, so things like the non-domestic rates pot is outside the budget as presented. Um, and that that presents opportunities because of the way it's managed on a rolling basis, um, either to take money out or to put money in. From this year, we have the new borrowing and reserve powers, again, which, which bring in, for different purposes, different streams of money that aren't shown directly in the revenue budget, which is presented to Parliament. So the decision we took as a group was that the best thing to do was to um, stick with the, the current um, arrangements for uh, government aid being able to amend the budget, but instead to focus very heavily on the transparency and the accessibility of the information and um, on the importance of that covering the whole of the budget, not just individual elements. We need to see how all of those new moving parts around borrowing and reserves, um, around the block grant adjustments and the way they work, the interaction between forecasts and reconciliations later, how all of that is operating in terms of the amount of money that's available and the choices that are made about tax raising in future. Um, one of the recommendations in the report is for a fiscal framework outturn report, which puts all of that again into the public domain and gives everybody the, th the same basis for understanding where there might be levers that could be used um, to raise more money for investment, for spending, or indeed for tax cuts in future, if that's, if that's the decision the Parliament comes to. So we considered it carefully, but that's the basis for the recommendations we made. Okay, thank you. Now, yeah, that's very helpful, Camilla. I mean, I suppose that the, the, the lesson is, in future, when the budget is presented, the first question that will, will be asked to the Finance Secretary is, is this the... Is this the complete picture, and what else is there that's not being presented? The medium-term financial statement and the fiscal yeah. framework outturn report will give you, as parliamentarians, information on which to ask those questions in an informed way. Okay, thank you. Patrick. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I suppose following on from that, um, there's, a, there's a need to recognise that as well as um, the, the, the objective you set out at the beginning of, of allowing Parliament uh, greater opportunity to influence uh, the budget, presumably before its publication, there is also a political process that comes after publication. Um, and whatever view, I'm sure there are different views about the, the merits of any particular outcome in any one year, uh, the question about transparency and, and uh, having a finance secretary not holding back further information is really important. Um, Given that we're now in a period where we're all being forced to accept that the budget process itself after publication is much shorter than it used to be and that that doesn't look likely to change, uh, I would say that that increases the argument in favour of giving opposition parties some ability to make amendments. The, given that you've, you've reached the view uh, that that's not what you, you want to propose, um, I would just ask how you... Um, how you discussed or how you struck the balance between uh, coherence of a budget and political accountability to Parliament, and the, uh, uh, particularly the, the, the current period of a, of a minority administration is relevant to this, but the years of coalition were relevant to this as well, and some of the same criticisms uh, of a political deal between parties resulting in a lack of coherence in, in budgets. Uh, some of those arguments were made at that time as well. And we need a, a process that's going to be able to work in periods of potentially majority, minority and coalition administration in the future. Uh, so just give me a sense of how it was you think that your recommendations reflect the importance of parliamentary process and the reality that there will be a political process after publication uh, perhaps on uh, a bit of a breakneck timescale that hasn't always worked well in the past. Yeah. Um, maybe starting at the, the end point there about the post-publication um, and trying to, to create space that doesn't exist in the calendar at that point. And that's where the emphasis on the pre-budget scrutiny, the opportunity and really the, the necessity of greater committee 
involvement and scrutiny over the year. Um, and the pre-budget influence, the pre-budget formulation and um, setting out proposals from the committee um, processes, that we felt um, increases um, the involvement of Parliament more in the round um, and engages Parliament much more in the propositions and proposals that should inform and, and, and structure um, the proposals in, in the budget. Um, there's also the recommendation that um, the spring budget revision should be accompanied by a mid-year report on revenue and spending um, up to the end of December, and that the mid-year report should be, should be scrutinised. So when you take the basket of measures across the report, there's engagement public engagement and parliamentary engagement and scrutiny, proactive involvement from the committees, not just in a scrutiny role, but in the pro proposition of pre-budget proposals, and the, the kind of data that James Kelly was asking us about earlier on, as well as increased finance, the, the kind of monitoring of um, the finances over the course of the year. So we have to, what we've tried to present is, is a series of proposals that have to be taken as a whole because of their interlinking nature, all of which are intended to derive greater accountability and transparency. I notice that paragraph 167 deals with some of the nitty gritties of this. Could you just expand some of that? So, again, for the, for the wider listener who doesn't, isn't as close to all of this as, as we are, I think it would be helpful in response to Patrick's point. Absolutely. And I think the first thing to say is that we were very conscious that um, although we are all working in a particular um, composition of Parliament at the moment, that what we design has to be able to cope with every possible permutation that can come out of our electoral system. It's not about a minority government, thank you, majority government or anything else. It's about what Parliament needs to work. Um, and... Um, as, as I said earlier, one of the key things we were trying to balance was, first of all, proper parliamentary influence, with secondly, the ability to manage a budget and keep uh, fiscal sustainability um, as a key consideration in there to avoid the risks of the sort of pork barrel politics we've all seen elsewhere that, that lead to decisions that are politically palatable this year, but lead to long-term problems after that. Um, we... We felt that the package of recommendations that we're making that put more information in the public domain in for the longer term with the medium term financial strategy and the fiscal, fa uh, fiscal framework outturn report are a good starting point. The um, longer term evaluative phase that Angela's talked about influence committees' pre budget reports in ways that should be driving some of that shift in the proposals that the government publishes in the budget bill. Um, and the budget bill itself giving that m much more complete picture of the public finances rather than just one angle on it with other um, moving parts elsewhere that aren't included all limits the um, risk of uh, um, misunderstood or just Ill, not understood changes coming through at a later stage. Um, but equally, we, we recognise that this will always be a political process. This is a parliament, it's the way parliament operates. So increasing transparency all the way through was a key part of what we were looking to do. Um, and the ability for um, uh, the uh, government to bring in uh, amendments at the stage two process felt to us was a key part of the ability to reflect on the negotiations that are happening and will always happen, the influence that's coming from committees as part of their scrutiny, and the scrutiny by this committee of the big picture um, of what's happening with borrowing reserves, with forecasts of revenues and spending for the future, was the best overall balance that we've got. There clearly is no right answer, but we felt that what it does is respect the fact that this is a political process, shine more light on the ways in which it's working and provide Parliament in general with more information about the impact of the changes it's making than it currently has was the, the right place to land. The, the fact that um, the, the political discussion led to stage two amendments last time round was unusual. Are you suggesting that that should become the norm, that that should be an expectation, that if the government reaches agreement with other political parties, it should be expressed through a formal process of stage two amendments going through uh, on the record? 
I think we felt that that mechanism was already there, um, that, it, that it is better than the ability for any political party to bring forward amendments for the reasons that we, we've discussed already. And that what was... Mostly hasn't been used. Precisely. It's been rare. Precisely. And what I was going to move on to say was that the thing that makes it both um, more... Uh, a more managed part of the process um, and make one that which is better understood is the greater transparency about the overall picture within which decisions, amendments are being made and the ways in which they'll be funded um, and the long-term impact of those in the context of a medium-term financial strategy. Um, if, I, if I stick with the experience we had last year, you're right, it's very rarely been used. The amounts involved weren't huge in the context of the overall 34 billion or so we're talking about, but equally, um, some of that money we know came from uh, different assumptions about the balance on the non-domestic rates account. Parliament should have been able to see that impact and um, what it means in terms of trends it, while um, voting for or not the budget as it went through. So we think it makes the use of those more effective um, and m more likely to lead to good fiscal decision making. The other... Sorry, so I can finish that bit off. You've also specifically said in your recommendations 40 and 49, some changes to the existing process, where you say, particularly in 49, the group also recommends that any changes to the Scottish budget published spending proposals during the budget process must be dealt with through amendments to the budget bill at stage two and stage three. So that's, a, so that's actually taking it a stage further than we've currently got, where it's in the government's will. But, you're at, but in, in, this, in this regard, I think, you're, I, I think you're suggesting that should be a process that becomes a norm. Absolutely. Right, just so I'm absolutely As clear. I say, for all of us, this is about making it more transparent and better understood in terms of the decisions being made and their longer-term consequences. I think it gives Parliament greater control. Sorry, Patrick. Thank you. The, the other aspect of parliamentary scrutiny that I was interested in, in talking about is on the tax side. Uh, obviously, a, a large part of the, the purpose of the budget review process has been to... Uh, understand how we evolve from scrutinising a spending budget or almost entirely a, a spending budget to one that's much more balanced between uh, taxation and spending. Now, I understand entirely why you didn't feel able it, within the process of this review to make a clear recommendation on the idea of a finance bill, but you've said that that should be examined further. Um, in the interim, have you discussed uh, how we might achieve a uh, a, a higher standard or a, a more regularised standard of scrutiny of tax instruments uh, before we get to the point of making a, a longer-term decision on a finance bill. We have a negative instrument on non-domestic rates, which is a major tax power. Uh, we have a, a much more uh, high-profile and tightly time-constrained process on income tax rates, a rate resolution that needs to be passed uh, very, very in a very, very tightly defined timescale to get the, to the budget. For legislative reasons, we've had a, a much higher level of scrutiny of something like uh, LBTT. Um, the council tax is still, in theory, a local tax, but it's, the, the constraints around it are bound up with a, a national budget process. Have you had any discussion about how we might achieve a, a, a common standard of scrutiny uh, for relevant tax powers in the interim before we, we get to a, a point which might be several years down the line of making decisions about a finance bill? I think in some ways this was one of the most difficult areas that we looked at because it is so technical and because the um, legislative provisions have built up piecemeal over time for reasons we all understand. Um, we heard some quite strong views from different stakeholders um, about the, the need um, to review this and to streamline it a bit. Um, and you'll recall that when I was here with John Peebles and Jim Mitchell earlier in the year on our draft report, you asked us then about the possibility of a finance bill. We considered that um, and we ruled it out of our consideration on the basis we were very keen to make recommendations that were in the power of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government, not ones that would require changes to UK legislation. We've made some recommendations for um, streamlining and improving the quality of uh, tax legislation in terms of the way that it's reviewed for minor sort of housekeeping changes as they come through to avoid some of the um, difficulties and teething problems we've seen as the devolved taxes have first come in. But to be frank, we feel that that's an area that needs more time and more consideration than we were able to give it as part of this report. Um, and it's something that could uh, 
could appropriately sit alongside the implementation of these recommendations. Um, these would improve things in any case, but I'm sure there's more fine-tuning that could be done around the tax leg legislative provisions. Do you want to add to that? Um, there's not much more I would add other than, than in terms of the, the principles and, and you know, the common standard of scrutiny being around the principles um, of, of taxation, the so-called Scottish approach to taxation, and within that, you know, so, so to ensure that whatever proposals um, around tax instruments, which are political choices, but um, that the scrutiny um, that is applied be from the perspective of you know, equality, implement, you know, how they can be implemented and, and uh, the kind of uprating and uh, uh, take up and so on. Um, I wanted to ask on equalities as well. I don't know if you want to bring others in on this point first. No, listen, I think we've, we've covered a fair bit of ground um, already. I think it's the key components of what we're, of the process have already been discussed. So I think it's appropriate just to okay. finish off your, your question, then, Patrick. Um, thank you. If I can um, come to Dr O'Hagan in the first instance on this. In, in your opening remarks, I, I think you said that the Scottish uh, approach to... Uh, equalities analysis uh, is better than elsewhere in the UK. Um, I wonder if you'd agree that that's setting a bit of a low bar uh, and that actually what we have um, should not be seen as a, as a model uh, but, but uh, as, as a starting point to, to, to build on uh, much more substantively. We've got uh, an equalities statement that accompanies the budget uh, which I would suggest and I would ask if you agree places a lot of emphasis on the value of positive things that the government thinks it's doing, uh, but does very little uh, to analyse the impacts of, um, for example, uh, cuts. Let's just look in the last few years, the, the number of jobs that have been lost in local government as a result of the constraints on local government spending. There hasn't really been any attempt by the Scottish government to produce an equalities impact assessment or an analysis of the equalities impact on, of those kind of decisions. Um, and uh, the, the government claims that they are unable to, that they claim that they have a lack of suitable evidence base to conduct uh, an intersection analysis, the kind of distribution analysis that your uh, recommendations uh, uh, call for. Yet, you'll be very well aware that the, the women's budget group itself has uh, done a, a fair amount of that kind of work with existing data that's already available. So, um, I mean, is it is it the case that the Scottish government, uh, you know, has been unwilling to go further, uh, unwilling to do what's already possible? Uh, and if that's the case, why would we assume that uh, if they if they have more data available, they'll do what's needed with it when they haven't been doing what's needed with the data they've already got. Okay, <laughs> there's quite a lot in there. Um, I would start by saying while the Scottish approach and the equality budget statement is maybe um, used phrase, it's not, it shouldn't be used as a model. Um, it is the very best of what's going on within the UK, where um, there is very limited equality analysis. There is no equality impact assessment and no similar documentation surrounding the UK budget, for example. I've consistently said, both within the Equality Budgets Advisory Group and in successive consultations and evidence sessions to Parliament and elsewhere, that I think the Equality Budget Statement as it stands, while a very important development in our budget process, is a narrative accompaniment to the budget decisions. It is not an equality impact assessment. And what we have recommended in the Budget Review Group report is that we move more to the, the typology, the approach advocated by the OECD of ensuring that we have an ex-ante, concurrent and ex-post equalities analysis um, of the budget. And by creating or encouraging the creation of this year-round scrutiny of parliamentary involvement, creating many more access points and entry points for equality analysis um, to 
prompt and, and require of government and within parliamentary scrutiny, because the committees themselves um, could be much more robust, I would argue, in some of the, the equalities analysis that shouldn't just be concentrated within the Equalities Committee, but across all the subject committees that would begin to address some of the issues you've raised there, um, Mr Harvey, on, for example, the impact on local government employment. Um, let's not forget the local government, you know, the, the impact of, of services and ser public service reform and where the impact of that that falls usually on low-paid, um, precariously employed women. So um, the kind of approach that we're advocating is to make more of the public sector equality duty requirements um, to ensure that, that proposals coming forward within the budget as much from committees as from the spending departments, are subject to quality impact assessment, um, and that a wider range of, of equality analysis tools are used, including beneficiary analysis, so trying to work out what the impact will be. There has been significant improvement in the equalities data available in Scotland that can be put in, you know, brought into to much more effective use in the analysis. And indeed, the Scottish Government have recently been saying the in relation to the budget and the relationship between the budget and the national performance framework, um, that there is um, you know, better data there and more should more more uh, should be used. Um, the kinds of of analysis we're talking about isn't what what's currently in the equality budget statement, and that's why. The, the report has rec made the recommendations we have, um, both to strengthen and improve the equality budget statement, to reconsider the timing of it and the purpose of it and the use to which it can be applied in Parliament. Um, the recommendations on distributional analysis are there for a reason. We know the data has improved and that improving distributional analysis will improve parliamentary and public understanding of the impact and outcomes from public spending. Um, and so there is an, in, an, in, an, an increase availability of, of data. We still have data gaps, un, undoubtedly. Um, but there needs to be both the political will within government and within parliament to bring that data into better use and to commit to that kind of intersectional analysis where we're looking at the lived experiences of women and men in all our diversity um, in Scotland and how public services and public finance in Scotland are advancing equality or not. And th that, I think, is the very basic question that, that must come before every committee. To what extent does any proposal that come before us advance equality and seek to eliminate inequalities? And if that proposal isn't going to do that, then go away and think again. And that's where I think we can look to other jurisdictions at subnational level with similar budget levels who have considerably more advanced equality analysis, like the, the Andalusian region in the south of Spain or at national level in, in Austria, where, which was one of the examples in the international report for the group. Without suggesting that, the, that perfection is achievable immediately, your view would be that the Scottish Government already has available to it the data that is necessary and the tools that are necessary to produce a much higher level of information for Parliament when it publishes its budget uh, on the impact of its budgetary decisions in terms of gender, disability, ethnicity, age, income decile, uh, that should be an expectation from us that government publishes that kind of information alongside its budget. We know there's significant deficiencies, there's a, a big improvement in data, but in in some areas there are still deficiencies and that's they're, they're historical, they're about the kinds of data sets that, there, that we have available, the population size for data sampling in Scotland uh, within UK samples, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a whole lot of technical reasons there. Um, but the, the point really is about not just producing the data alongside the budget, but using that data in the pre-formulation of budget options, using the data in the ex-post evaluation and concurrent evaluation, and using it in ex-ante formulation of budget proposals. But, but if, if they're using the data in that way to shape their budget, the way for them to show that they've done so is to show they're working when they publish the budget. 
showing their workings in the margins is a phrase I have, have used very often in relation to equality analysis. But it's not just, I mean, the emphasis here is, as well is, is on the public authorities and public bodies um, who, who are implementing the services funded through public finance. So that's why in the budget documentation that we talk about in, in the report, looking for committees to look much more widely and to look at the public sector equality duties and the associated um, publications that are required for compliance with that duty. So what is the NHS or Skills Development Scotland or the successor to Scottish Enterprise um, saying in their mainstreaming reports and in their audits um, about equalities and how they're advancing equalities and how those proposals are going to meet the overarching objectives of government and, and policies as, as proposed by parliamentary committees. That's helpful. Thank you very much. Right, we've had a good discussion around year, year round budget processes, longer term planning, timing revisions, mid term financial strategy, which I think is hugely important, particular part. A very quick question, um, Ivan. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, it was really just to focus on um, outcomes, and I'm glad to see you've given that some attention. Um, and the national performance framework, which is something I think we don't talk about often enough. Uh, in this committee and in subject, subject committees. Um, there's clearly difficulties in a row subject committee that I'm on struggle to establish the relationship between um, the input funding and the outcomes that are delivered and how you line those up and you, you talk about that. Um, and I see you're talking here about um, potentially moving from portfolio-based budgeting to programme-based budgeting, which would be interesting. Can you, you maybe just talk around about the discussions you had and the difficulties you see there and what we need to do to get this committee and subject committees to move more firmly in that direction, looking back on what's happened and not just having this political bun fight about how we're going to um, line up input funding going forward? Um, I think it was common ground in the group and among all of the external stakeholders we heard from that the outcomes approach is a good thing, um, that we absolutely should be looking at the outcomes we're trying to achieve rather than how many nurses, doctors, teachers we have um, taking that longer term view and that there's more that can be done to link those outcomes to the money that we're spending which is the key way that any government, any organisation aims to achieve its aims um, and alongside that, that as the outcomes are being um, agreed and set there's more that government and public bodies can be doing to set out their plans for how they want to shift those outcomes. Um, at the moment, in many areas, we think there's a gap between the outcomes in the national performance framework and, and the way they cascade down, um, and the plans that government has and all of the people involved in um, trying to shift those outcomes have for how they will actually go about it. Now, that's a complex thing. It's not for most of the outcomes that are in the, the framework and that we care about. You don't just crank a handle um, and you can see what's changing. But equally, we think there is much more room. Um, for example, if one of the outcomes is about keeping people safer by reducing reoffending, to be clear, what are the interventions that the evidence says reduce reoffending? Um, what are the ones that we intend to try here in Scotland or in different parts of Scotland? Uh, what money we'll put behind that and how we will know over time that things are moving in the right direction and that therefore we can do more of it or the wrong direction and therefore we think again. So we've got a section in the report about the planning for outcomes um, and the way that that would be done in the Scottish budget overall but also within the budgets of the public bodies that Angela's referred to um, and that information itself would give the subject committees much more to be working with in testing and challenging whether that thinking stood up to scrutiny, um, whether the evidence available is changing over time and therefore policy should and, and the direction of money should. Um, and it felt to us that was all a very positive direction of travel that would build on the good things that are already in place with the national performance framework and the outcomes approach that we've got embedded in legislation now in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you much. Um, can I say, first, as I said at the beginning, this has been an excellent report and, took, and I think this session has been very, very valuable. There's obviously lots of processes and procedures you've laid in there, but the one thing that I think I heard a couple of times was culture change. And I think it's going to take a significant culture shift within the Parliament to be able to make sure some of these processes, processes, procedures are embedded in actually what we do in a, in, in a meaningful way. Now, obviously, the Financial Issues Advisory Group set the foundation stones for the parliamentary, parliamentary um, budget process. They did a rigorous and a robust job on it. We've got an opportunity now, I believe, to take us forward to a completely different level, produce that world-class budgeting process and the constraints that we all work with under. And if we can achieve that on an all-party basis, I think we've done the Parliament 
and, and Scotland proud, and I hope we can get to that end. And I, and I want to thank you for your helping us push us along that road. Now the clerks will bring forward a, a paper at a future meeting setting out our suggested approach to the implementation of the review group's final report. And again, thank you, and I close this particular part of the meeting. Cheers. Bye -bye.